Hi, and welcome to the A Push Show with myself, Mr. Weber, and my co-host, William Howard Taft. William Howard Taft, how do you feel about being a co-host on a show? Yeah, I bet it does. Anyway, this is a show where we briefly give you some tips about taking AP U.S. history and also give you an overview of the chapter you are supposed to read. Um, the chapter you are reading this week is chapter one from the Alan Brinkley text, American History, as you dive in to this big, gnarly textbook that will give you a pretty good sense of what happened throughout American history. As usual, this is just a preview of what you're going to go see in this textbook. It's not the textbook itself. This should not completely replace reading of the textbook. It's good to watch this. It's better to watch this and read the textbook. And so that brings us to our historical thinking skills for this chapter. For comparison, we have a couple of them. We're going to see how well you can compare the regional differences among Native Americans before the arrival of Europeans in the 15th century. Remember that Native Americans are not monolithic. It's very, very, very false to look at all of them in the same way. They have a lot of nuance and variation between different groups depending on where they lived and what culture they were brought up in, just like anybody else. We're also going to compare how different European countries settled in the Americas. We're going to look at what the Spanish did, what the English did, what the French, and what the Dutch immigrants did. How they settled, how they worked, how they lived in the New World. Next, we're going to look at causations. We're going to look at cause and effects of the beginnings of African slave labor in the Americas. One of the prevailing themes we see over and over and over again is basically who is an American and who maybe is not as much of an American. And a lot of that we can trace to these early days in terms of the hierarchy created based heavily on labor. Next, we'll look at periodization. We'll look at sort of the context of the time period and what the impact of the system of mercantilism was on European colonization of North America. So within the lens of mercantilism, what was going on in the European psyche as they sought to colonize North America. Lastly, we have another causation as we try to identify both the positive and negative impacts of the Colombian exchange, that is the exchange of various foodstuffs, other materials, and of course diseases between the world of Europe, Asia, and Africa, and the world of North and South America. Spoiler alert, one group had a much better experience with the Colombian exchange than the other. Taft, can you maybe guess who that would be? Well, that's your opinion now, isn't it? So this chapter is broken up into three sections. We'll look at America before Columbus. We'll look at Europe as it looked westward, kind of Europe before Columbus did his thing and established contact between the Eurasian continent and North and South America. And then we'll also look at the arrival of the English. But first, we have a boatload of bias going on in this image here. Look at this image and see if you can identify the bias within this image. See if you can identify who probably drew this picture and how they represent the various groups presented within this image. That was fun. So let's look at America before Columbus, shall we, Taft? Okay. So here's what we know about the people of the pre-contact Americas, and I don't mean to diminish who they are, but we'll try to go them, through them relatively quickly. Um, we have the Clovis people, who are people who settled in sort of the southeastern-ish part of the United States, and it's named after the region. Um, what we know about the people of pre-contact America, pre-contact meaning pre-contact with people of Europe, Africa, and Asia, um, is that we know that they were diverse. It's false to think of themselves, to think of them as all being the same. And we call this period the Archaic Period, which is sort of a period of settlement in which before we start to see what we know as civilizations emerge. Um, we know that they came from uh, somewhere in Asia, probably somewhere in around northern China and Mongolia, and slowly, it's very important to remember that it was slow, slowly made their way through what is now Alaska, through Canada, and settled eventually in North and South and Central America and established various civilizations there. 
Um, what we have to know is that some of them traveled by land, and also during this time, most of this area was covered by ice because an ice age had occurred and was diminishing. And we know that they may have walked, but some of them may have actually bounced along the Pacific Northwest. Some of them maybe even traveled directly across the Pacific Ocean um, and settled in areas like Central and South America. Again, a lot of these are theoretical, but they are rooted in a lot of fact. And where they settled would determine how their way of life functioned. We have certain native groups who settled in the eastern part of the United States who had sort of pseudo-agricultural lifestyles along with hunting and gathering, people in the Great Plains who were more mobile, people in the southwest who had sort of a combination of settled agricultural societies as well as hunting and gathering, and then of course people in Mexico, what is now Mexico, sort of doing the same in which they have settled civilized societies but also hunter-gatherer societies. So we see a lot of variance with native groups. It's false to think of them as the same way we know that there's a lot of diversity. So civilizations grew before Columbus arrived. We see big settled agriculturally based societies in the Incas, the Mayas, and the Mexica. You probably know the Mexica as the Aztecs. Taft, do you know the Aztecs? Do you know who they are? No. Oh, sorry. Didn't mean to offend your sensibility. Anyway, here you see an image of a Mayan period uh, to the god Kukulkan. The Mayan period, the Mayan pyramids are the very common sort of artifact we see from Central American civilized societies. They weren't the only ones who made pyramids. Uh, the Mexica did as well, and you can still see many of those in the areas around Mexico City. Whereas the civilizations in the north were not quite as settled as the ones in Central America. Um, but however, they were still very complex and had a lot of variance between them. Most of them got their uh, sustenance from hunting, gathering, or fishing. Taft, what do you think about hunting? Oh yeah, big fan. Um, one of the largest settlements was in the area known as Cahokia. There are still earthen mounds there, and Cahokia is in the area we now know as St. Louis. Um, we don't know a ton about it because unfortunately a lot of it died out when Europeans made contact and the exchange of diseases, which was very uneven, wiped out a huge portion of what we know as Cahokia. Um, next, your book will mention um, tribal cultures and how they were influenced by their own agricultural revolution. We call it a revolution because it dramatically changed the way people lived. Um, before that, they were mostly hunting and gathering, but with the advent of agriculture, that allowed people to stay put and not have to move around as much and allowed them to have more food, which allowed to have a sort of surplus of food, which meant people could do other things besides just make food. However, they are in the somewhat early stages of the agricultural revolution when compared to their European, African, and Asian counterparts. In terms of gender roles that sort of stem from this, we see that women had a very pronounced role in society. In the image, you see an image of Iroquois women taking on the roles of a lot of the home and agricultural life. Men oftentimes went off on hunts and were away for a lengthy period of time, um, which meant that Women were left at home to tend to the farms, or what basically constituted as farms, and also tend to their families. Because of that, women had much larger roles within Iroquois society. Um, they had a lot of influence in terms of the social and economic organization of the society, which would be quite different when we compare that to their European counterparts. So next, we're going to look at Europe as they look to expand westward, to establish a little context for you. Europe during this time was coming out of a period known as the Middle Ages, an, area, or an era in which they were very insular, did not really expand beyond their own continent. But now we see a reawakening of commerce as Europe looked to expand their commercial interests beyond just Europe and beyond just the Mediterranean world. One of the ways to do that was to do it by sail. And Prince Henry the Navigator, who is featured in that image right there, was one of the leading um, people, one of the leading monarchs to do that. Um, and we also see during this period the emergence of centralized nation states, meaning the idea of countries as we know them today started to emerge during this time. Before Europe began to look westward in the uh, 15th and 16th centuries, um, before that, it was more just sort of small decentralized kingdoms. You didn't necessarily have the idea per se of large nation states like Spain, 
France, England, or Portugal. But now we see the consolidation of these kingdoms into large nation states led by a central family, usually king or queen, some sort of monarchy. And Prince Henry the Navigator was one of the monarchs of Portugal, and he had the idea of using sea travel to expand the commercial interests of Portugal. Why didn't they do it by land? A big reason why they didn't do it by land is because so much of the territory was controlled by other groups, in particular the Ottoman Turks, who did not necessarily let people travel through their land to, to do commerce without being taxed heavily. It just wasn't economically feasible. Taft, you a big fan of economic feasibility? What do you think of that? Okay, then. So Europe looked westward as they had discovered or rediscovered in a sense that there was a lot to be gained from establishing commercial contacts with areas like the Chinese area and the countries around it as well as, as well as India. Lots of spice and various goods that could be brought back to Europe where if you could bring it back safely you could make a lot of money. One of the people that really popularized this idea was a guy by the name of Marco Polo who is of the famous game you play in a pool. Marco! Found you. Ah. And so that brings us from Portugal to Spain. Portugal established contacts throughout India and China, and Spain looked to do the same. And one uh, mariner from actually Genoa, who sought to have a monarch sort of finance his ideas and finance his voyage because he could make a lot of money from it, was this guy, Christopher Columbus. And his idea was to sail westward. He had this idea that the Earth was actually a lot smaller than it was, but he had the idea to sail from Spain all the way around the Earth to what is China and Japan in that region there. However, he did not know that there was these pretty massive continents in the way. He thought this was a lot smaller than it was. Taft, how big do you think the world is? Well, you know what? You're wrong. You're wrong. Yeah. So anyway, he sought to sail westward, and there were basically three main motivations for his voyage. And they would be the same motivation for a lot of Iberian conquerors, settlers, who would come over shortly after. And they were the three Gs. God, gold, glory to spread the Catholic faith, to get as rich as possible, and to bring glory upon oneself and one's country. Another person who also sort of began to do this was Ferdinand Magellan, who sought to expand Spain's influence, and also his own, by sailing all around the world and helping to colonize places along the way. However, unfortunately for old Ferdinand Magellan, he did not make it all the way as he got rooted in a conflict in the Philippines, got shot by a bow and arrow, and died. What do you think about that, Taft? Does that make you sad? Of course it doesn't, because you're a savage. And so here in this map, we see the various voyages of Columbus as they were predominantly in the Caribbean area along the areas of what we now know as Central America and the northern coast of South America. And that's where Spain pretty much did their thing. We'll see later English and Dutch explorers make their way to the more northern areas of the Americas. And we'll see French explorers, too, um, sort of further north than that. And so after Columbus and other explorers sort of begin to figure out their way around the Americas, we have the conquistadors who arrive. One of the most famous conquistadors was Hernan Cortes, who conquered the people known as the Aztecs living in Mexico. And what we take away from this in the sense of U.S. history is that the Spanish were incredibly brutal and greedy from the outset of their conquest of the Americas. And we'll see this in several writings, especially from the very historically noteworthy Bartolomé de las Casas, Bart of the Houses for you, because you don't speak Spanish. Um, who wrote extensively about the brutality of the Spanish conquerors. And they were incredibly brutal, according to these accounts. You hear about various conquerors um, waging war on the various native peoples, especially the Aztecs. We see a, all sorts of horrific acts of violence, intestines being spilled out. We see babies being thrown off of cliffs and that sort of thing. Just any act of violence they could. Um, and the reason for this was to break the spirit of the natives and to subjugate and conquer. Well, 
People like Bartolomé de las Casas spoke up, and the Spanish monarchy listened, and they instituted what were known as the Ordinances of Discovery, which sort of outlawed full-scale military conflict with the natives. However, various abuses did occur on smaller scales, however much more prevalently throughout Spanish America, and this would sort of give rise to what was known as the Black Legend, which was this idea of Spanish brutality, which would be used by various English and French advocates for colonization to show that, hey, look, when we colonize these places, we're not going to be brutal like Spain are. We're going to be civilized because we're better than Spain. And this sort of shows the massive amount of conflict and rivalry between European states as they sought to colonize the Americas. And also out of this came the idea of missionary work that, we, that the Spanish needed to civilize the natives, but in particular by converting them to Christianity. And we'll see that throughout the Spanish Americas, we'll see various missions arrive. But with those missions also came military presences, as a lot of these missionary workers, priests, friars, bishops, and that sort of thing, needed protection from potentially hostile native tribes who, for whatever reason, did not want to be forcibly converted to Christianity or be forcibly worked, sometimes, oftentimes, to death by their new Spanish conquerors. And these northern outposts are noteworthy because we see in St. Augustine, which is in Florida, it becomes the first European settlement in what is now known as the United States. So the Spanish were technically first in the United States. And we also see outposts in Santa Fe, which is notable because in 1680 there was a massive revolt from the Pueblo Native Americans who did not take too kindly to being subjugated by the Spanish. They were often worked to death. They were forced to assimilate to ways of life that they did not want to assimilate to, especially in their religion. And we also see that they did not want to have to do these things, and so they revolted. A leader named Pope led a revolt against the Spanish and succeeded, and they essentially pushed the Spanish out of what is now known as New Mexico for about 12 years until the Spanish came back and kind of brutally put down the revolt. However, certain accommodations were met. And we'll see in Spanish America there will be numerous attempts to completely eradicate native society. However, we will see all those attempts are failures. It is really hard to completely destroy a culture. Usually what happens is that when you take an old culture and you mix it with another culture, it becomes a completely new culture, which is really what America is in a lot of ways. Europeans can try to make things European around here. Natives can try to make things more native around here. But what invariably ends up happening is a new sort of hybrid culture emerges. And that's really what becomes the United States. And here we see a very old map of the world as it was known to Spanish missionaries and conquerors. As you can see, what is now known as the United States was largely unsettled because the Spanish really only made it up to Mexico and to areas like modern day New Mexico, Arizona, California, Colorado, Florida, and the southern uh, states like Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, those sort of places. Taft, do you want to go to Alabama? I didn't know you had such strong opinions about Alabama. And yes, the most predominant pattern of Spanish settlement is brutality, as we see in this picture of DeSoto waging war on natives who were living in modern day Alabama, which is probably why Taft has such strong opinions on Alabama. Um, we see this pattern over and over again in which the Spanish model was to go in and essentially take whatever they could, get as rich as possible, and who cares what the native thinks? That's their problem, not ours is the Spanish attitude, not my attitude or Taft's attitude. And so your textbook is going to call this the empire at high tide. And what that certainly implies it being a high tide is eventually it's going to go back into the sea because Spain's control over the large part of the world was somewhat short-lived. It was very exploitative and was not necessarily built to last. And Spain had very rigid control which limited growth and limited the autonomy of people living and trying to forge a new life in Spanish North, South, and Central America. And we see the constant collision of cultures as Spain tried to sort of force people to live a certain way. They resisted, they fought, and things aren't ever able to really cohese and become something new. 
But in addition to this, with this increased level of exchange, we see a lot of biological and cultural exchanges, and a new society emerges despite Spanish efforts to prevent it from doing so. However, with this comes massive demographic catastrophe, and that scores of the native population died. And the reason they died was because this massive imbalance of the biological exchange of disease. European and Asian diseases came over that were far more potent for natives who had no immunity to them whatsoever than the native diseases that went back over to Europe. Smallpox is going to kill way more people than the, probably the most deadly disease that came from the Native Americans, which was syphilis. Taft, do you know how you prevent from getting syphilis? Yeah, and that's why you can't because you've been neutered. No syphilis for you. You're welcome. However, apart from disease, there was also the exchange of goods and materials. New crops and agricultural techniques were introduced on both sides. For example, new uh, agricultural animals and draft animals were used for the first time in the Americas. Animals like cows, pigs, and horses. Horses, which we oftentimes associate with Native Americans, never came to the Americas until Europeans brought them over. And we also see new crops emerge in Europe. Crops like tomatoes. Imagine Italy with no tomatoes. How did they eat pizza? They didn't. At least not the kind of pizza we know of. Taft loves pizza. Big pizza fan. And we also have the potato go from the Americas to Europe. And the potato would actually be a massive game changer. We think of potatoes as just these sort of tasty things when you put butter and salt on them. But they actually were much more and caused the European population to explode because they grow so well and easily. But with these cultural exchanges, we see this emergence of a complex racial hierarchy. In a lot of ways, this is sort of the beginning of what we know as systemic racism in the literal sense. Because when you have all of these races, you have to sort of figure out a way to justify one group of people having a lot of privilege and power and other groups not. And a way to do that is to establish the idea of one race being superior than another. That is racism. And that's when this is created. It started in a lot of ways in the Iberian cultures of Spain and Portugal, but would be continued by other European groups as they sought advantage in using these sort of different labor systems based heavily on racial hierarchy. Which naturally leads us to our discussion of Africa. Now, I don't want to just present Africa as just this massive continent where Europeans got slaves from, because it is much more than that. Africa is a huge and diverse continent with a whole lot of history and a whole lot of interest and intrigue in its own right. However, within the context of U.S. history, we have to look at it in terms of the, uh, the emergence of the United States. So here's what we will say about Africa before Europeans arrive. It is a massive continent and it is very diverse. And in the context of U.S. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry about that, Taft. I apologize. Do you accept my apology? Oh, thank you. Um, we have two very large nation states known as Ghana and Mali. And we have much smaller ones in the western part of Africa called Benin, Congo, and Songhai. Um, African societies had been around for tens of thousands of years and established themselves for a long time with minimal contact with European society. In fact, for a long time, Europe referred to Africa, at least sub-Saharan Africa, as the Dark Continent. Hey, Taft. Do you know why they call they called Africa the Dark Continent? Wow, that's impressive. Good for you. Way to be knowledgeable and not racist. Yes, they called it the Dark Continent because it was mysterious. They didn't know much about it. They couldn't really get into it. And they did get into it much later. But here's what we do know about Africa within the context of U.S. history. Africans um, in the societies that we're dealing with when we talk about U.S. history were mostly matrilineal, meaning heredity was traced through the mother's side, not the father's side, unlike Europe. However, it does have a linkage with the Native American societies, which often were dominated by female influence. And before Europeans arrived, there was an African slave trade that already existed. 
We see in this map that extensive trade networks did exist between Sub-Saharan Africa and Northern Africa, which linked to Europeans. And Europeans were somewhat used to Africans trading slaves of their own as a means of trade, along with other goods like gold, silver, sorghum, yams, and that sort of thing. And so the trading of people was known by Europeans and accepted. However, though Africans did engage and sort of create an African slave trade before Europeans did, don't fall into the trap that a lot of racist voices will try to say that Africans invented the transatlantic slave trade because they didn't. Europeans took it to a whole new level, and the African idea of the role of a slave was far different than the traditional plantation role that we see in what is now the United States and the Caribbean and in South America. Yes, slavery existed in Africa before Europeans arrived, but Europeans took it to a whole new level that the Africans probably could have never even imagined. And lastly, that brings us to our third section, the arrival of the English. Um, John Cabot, in a lot of ways, is kind of the Christopher Columbus of England. He did an exploratory venture on behalf of the English monarchy to sort of see what was going on in the Americas and see what colonial opportunities existed. And there were a lot of them, and there was a big incentive for the English to do so. To give you a little context of what was going on in England, they were going through something known as the Enclosure Movement, which basically meant that a lot of England before the Enclosure Movement was kind of free and open in terms of the land. If there was a piece of land, you could farm on it and nobody really gave you much of a hard time. However, with the enclosure movement, the English government started partitioning off pieces of that land and selling it to people who could afford to buy it. And usually that was just rich land-owning nobles, which meant that a lot of people who usually farmed on that land found that they could not do so, which created a huge impetus to create more opportunities in the mercantile sector, which meant going to places, getting goods, bringing it back and selling it on the market and making a profit from that. And we see from that the emergence of chartered companies, which is when these merchants would basically get together and ask the English monarchy to give them the gift of a monarchy to conduct trade with a particular area. So they would do so in places like India with the British East India. India Company, where only a select group of merchants could go there and do trade. They did it in Russia, and they did it in the Americas, too. And we see with this emergence of trade in the Americas, people like Richard Heckloyd, probably butchering his name, but man, does he have a sweet set of armor there, argue that colonies would not only help your uh, English merchants do business, but it would also do something to, about those annoying poor people who couldn't find work and didn't have farm to act farmland to work on. And he said, you know what, this would be a great place to sort of deposit that surplus population. Taft, do you think of any person as surplus? <coughs> of course you do. You would think that. Because you're a monster. And so just like Spain had a bit of a religious incentive, you'll read that the English did as well. The English subscribed a bit to this idea of the doctrine of predestination, which was a Protestant idea, which is Protestant meaning not Catholic, because there was that great split that maybe you remember from your world history class, maybe you don't. But the idea of predestination is that certain people were born to go to heaven and certain people were not. How do you know who goes to heaven and who doesn't? By how they act. If you act religious and you do the right thing, you're going to go to heaven. Taft, do you think you were born saved? Do you think you're going to go to heaven? Well, I hope you do too. hope I see you up there because I'm going to go to heaven. But anyway... With the Reformation came other sort of Christian ideas and Christian ways of sort of worshiping God and living a religious life, and that's where we have the Puritans, who didn't necessarily jive too well with the Anglican Church, which is the main church of England. And Puritan discontent was very common and growing in England at this time, and they wanted to find a new area of the world where they could set up their own society, worship God in the way that they wanted, and form a society based around those religious ideas. And so we see the English sort of beginning to play with this idea of colonization with Ireland, the uh, island literally right next door, and they would subjugate and take it over in pretty brutal fashion. In fact, to this day, there's a lot of Irish people that don't really like English people because of it. 
the English would establish a plantation model, which you'll read in your book is basically something where they would set up an area within a place that they conquered and try to make it as British as possible, usually failing. Because remember, when you try to take one culture and you try to completely have it take over that other culture, it does not work. Usually you have a mix or fusing of cultures, which creates something completely new. Which brings us to the French and the Dutch in the Americas. Um, the French and the Dutch had a much different approach to colonization in that at first they weren't really doing a ton of colonization, especially the French. The French were more interested in establishing fur trading posts, especially with the model of the Coureurs du Bois. What do you think that French pronunciation taft? Well, that's kind of mean. And you also have Dutchmen like Henry Hudson, who the Hudson River is named for, which is right next to New York, which was actually a Dutch colony before the English got it and named it New York, after the area in England called York. And which lastly brings us to our final slide on the first English settlements. The English started to grow more and more confident in their ability to travel by sea with the Spanish Armada success in 1588. Taft, if you guessed that the Spanish Armada was in 1588, you are correct. Anyway, we also have Gilbert's expedition to Newfoundland. As you'll read, it was basically an exploration into what is now known as Canada, which England also colonized for a while, but would then have to give over to France, and then they kind of got it back, and there's a lot of fighting over that that we'll look at later. Which brings us to Roanoke, the first English settlement in the Americas in what is now Virginia. It was a massive failure. Oh! That's a big stretchums, which is, means it's time for our big stretch. Hope you enjoyed the stretch. Back to Roanoke. Roanoke was the first colony, and it was a disaster. The people that were left there did not know how to farm, thought they could maybe just get some gold and leave, did not make friends with the natives, either got in fights with the natives or didn't farm enough and eventually starved to death. When the English supply ships tried to come back and replenish them, a lot of the first Roanoke colony got on the ship and tried to go back to England. It was a phenomenal disaster and it took a couple of tries in this colony before a functional settlement could occur but we see and during this time in England new colonial charters would emerge especially the London Charter in the southern part of what is now the United States and the Plymouth Charter in the north the Charter in the south being much more economically founded whereas the Plymouth Charter had a bit more religious taft that's disgusting people don't need to see that I apologize for my co-host. He's very boorish. Okay? And the Plymouth Charter in the North, which was more religious-based. Okay? And we'll see in Chapter 2 sort of how these societies emerge and how they function in the very early days of the English experience in the Americas, which was also a French experience, which was also a Dutch experience, which was also a Spanish experience, which was more so a native experience as they experienced the most change. That's chapter one. Remember to read the chapter because that is the most important thing. This hopefully gave you a good sense of what is going on and gave you a good idea of what to look for in the chapter. On behalf of William Howard Taft and myself, who is discovering the earth right now, thank you for watching and hopefully you got something out of this. And remember, keep pushing, G. Get out of there, freak.